Right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you very much to the people that are in the room. Um, I haven't seen it this full for many a meeting, so it can only be a comment on what we're about to see. Um, so before I introduce tonight's speakers, a couple of other points. We have the Engineering Group Conference coming up on the 11th to the 13th. Tickets are available. Details are on our page. It's looking to be a very good few days, uh, very educational, very interesting. Please go and have a look and come along if you can. Um, the next meeting after this will be the 18th of April. And it's a joint meeting with the BGA on their case studies prize. Um, and now this evening, we're very fortunate to have Mr. Adrian Coe, Professor Bill Murphy, to talk about their work on Syria, C810, natural slopes, condition assessment and mitigation. As always, there will be questions at the end. I'll be manning a laptop. So if you've got any questions as we're going through, please type them through and I'll try and go through all of them at the end of the evening. So if I can, everybody can give us a round of applause to, to welcome Adrian and, and Bill to the stage. Thank you very much. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as Scott said, my name is Bill Murphy. Um, I'm an engineering geologist based at the University of Leeds. Um, what we're going to talk about is Syria C810. And in fact, although we said that we're the authors, we are in fact only part of a larger authorship team of which at least one other member is sitting here tonight to whom we'll be directing all questions. Um, what we're, so what we're going to do is a little bit of an outline about the presentation. We're going to start talking, I'm going to talk a little bit about Syria. I'm going to talk about why we've adopted the classification scheme we have and how to classify landslides. I will talk a little bit about landslides and climate change, a bit about what we know and what we don't know, and the latter being an awful lot. And then I'm going to pass over to, to Eddie. So we've kind of got a packed programme for Double Act tonight. Um, so with that, I will we'll kick on. So the outline presentation is going to be pretty much as you can see there. We have an introduction to Syria and to the report, what we wanted to achieve. We'll talk about landslide classification and landslides as a natural process. We'll talk about landslides, climate change, hazard assessment, and then we'll conclude by talking about mitigation and management to a certain extent, mainly to the um, mitigate, well, mitigation and management. I will now stop babbling. So first of all, what is what is Syria? Well, Syria is a, you probably, you've all heard of Syria in the doubt. So the, the Construction Industry Research and Information Association, to break down the acronym, and the aim of the, the organization is really to try and bring good, clear guidance to practitioners based on research performed either in industry or collaboration with academia, but nevertheless, to try and pull together um, a variety of sources of information to produce uh, best practice guides. We'll, we'll go with best practice guides for a moment. The membership is broad, it spans professional practice, academia, uh, government agencies, consultants, contractors, you know, that, that's a wide range of, of people that you can see there. The membership of Syria is equally broad. Uh, each of those logos represents uh, an ind individual membership. Um, you can see that, that We've got mix of UC, we've got UCL, Southampton as academic institutions. Um, are up Atkins, perhaps unsurprisingly, given the, the authorship team tonight. And the quite a broad range of, of organizations within that. So Syria is an organization. How does it choose what it wants to do? Well, first of all, the, the, those research needs need to be driven by you, the community. There's no point in other people coming up with those ideas because it has to drive and guide your activities. You need to identify what the key gaps are. There is a certain mechanism of updating out-of-date information or rather older information when practice has changed or new science has developed. 
and you've got uh, a series of, of of guys that are in development looking at some of the really big questions and how we steer the future of the organization through uh, principally you, the uh, practitioners. That's not to say universities are uninvolved, but it has to face you, you uh, practitioners. Now, we're going to be talking about the natural slopes guide tonight. That is not, uh, that is only one of a suite of guides which are re relevant to this topic. So, for example, if we look at geotechnical slope drainage, it's related to development of instability and, of course, the sustainable geosystems and civil engineering as a, as a tool, management tool, again, relevant to some of what we're talking about tonight. So that's a little bit of background information on Syria as an organisation and what they're doing and, and uh, where we go with that. My interest, of course, are in things like this. And this is a, a landslide that resulted in a derailment at Lock Hilt in 2018. Photographs from the, or at least the, the uh, photograph is from the rail accident investigation branch, branch, thank you, um, investigation of the landslide. And you can see that this is a, a landslide that's actually traveled quite some distance. When we deal with looking at infrastructure assets, we may only think about the asset itself, but natural slopes present us with a challenge. And therefore we need to think a little bit about how we assess that going forward. We do have a problem with, with some really quite significant documents, such as the natural slopes guidance, uh, the landslide in Great Britain that is out of print. So there was a requirement for some documentation which actually was going to fill a gap. We're all pro we've all probably learned about um, slope stability analysis and the, the way in which we deal with embankments and engineered slopes, but dealing with natural slopes presents different challenges. And in fact, the number of landslides we've seen, for example, in the Isle of Wight this year, highlights the importance of us looking at the behavior of natural slopes a little bit beyond thinking of factors of safety and so on. If we look, <clears throat> I'll try that again. This voice isn't mine, I'm breaking it in for a friend. Um, if we look at the summary of contents within the document, uh, we can break it down into a number of broad parts. First of all, we look at the condition of, of the, I'll go with asset for the moment, but it's broader than just an asset that we're dealing with or condition of the slopes. We define what natural slopes are, for example. We look at some of the factors affecting deterioration, degradation. We look at landslides, their classification and identification. We look at how we can assess slopes. We look at the mitigation of slopes. And of course, we have to think a little bit about where we go in the future and what we do with future research. Because ultimately, of course, just as the landscape is dynamic, the science underpinning what we understand about natural slopes is also dynamic. Um, you know, if uh, as a, a nod to the, the late Dennis Brunsden, you know, all of that work done understanding dynamic equilibrium of slopes that was driven by, by Dennis is something that really we need to, to keep in mind. So let's just think about what that first component, the, the thing that, that I'm interested in, in terms of talking about natural slopes and landslide classification and natural processes. Now, there's some of you will be thinking, well, why, why bother classifying landslides at all? Um, a source of, uh, it's a bit of a bugbear for me personally, because I constantly see misclassifications of landslides being used in the, in, not, not just the news, but also in the technical literature and frankly by people who should know better. But why classify them? Well, it helps to understand the processes that are driving slope movement. And those are dynamic. They have rates. And therefore, we can think about the value of the understanding of those processes over the design life of any, anything we are dealing with. 
the ground is not static. And I think we all know that as geologists. A successful classification of landslide problems or the, of landslide type or likely movement type can help us get, give us information with regards to likely rates of movement. We know that some landslides, like rock avalanches, which fortunately we don't see very many of in this country, um, move, tend to move very, very rapidly. Debris avalanches and debris flows tend to move very rapidly. And so we can classify uh, you know, on that basis for at least starting to think about mitigation measures. It can give us some indication of likely travel distances. And I mean, you know, and, and that's a very, very broad context. But again, if we think of, of rotational landslides, for example, they're likely to be, their they're overall travel distances as a proportion of their size are likely to be somewhat smaller than, for example, um, uh, debris flows, which are channelized. The classification will guide our analytical tools. And that's, that's an important observation. And the classification will guide our mitigation strategies. You know, whether or not we're dealing with a, a landslide that is a kind of rigid block movement, as opposed to something which is a flow slide, gives us very different uh, requirements for mitigation. If we take, for example, in one example of that by way of illustration, um, we can look at the behavior of debris avalanches. So in this context, it's a, a debris flow which is on an open slope, it's not channelized. And I'll come to that classification scheme in just a moment. Um, we can look at correlations between rainfall uh, rain, and rainfall intensity and the likely movement of or the likely evolution of, of landslides. So the rainfall and the duration and how debris, debris avalanches will evolve and, and the, the size of those. So this, this comes from work by um, Winter et al. We're looking at, uh, lo looking at assessing the hazard posed by this particular category of landslides. Again, done on the basis of successful classification. Now, there have been a number of classification schemes over, over years, decades, in fact, going back to Dave Varnes' original work in 1978, um, work of Cruden and Varnes in, in 1996, the uh, World, World, uh, World Programme on Landslides, 95, work by Richard Dickow and others in 96, but we settled on the work of Hunger et al. in 2014 as the most recent form of classification scheme and probably the most comprehensive. It takes out some of the ambiguities that, that arose in Varnes and Cruden and Varnes and you know, it allows for as not packaging things into there's so many different large landslides just falling into the complex category. Um, so the, the, the hunger et al uh, myth approach is the one which we use in the guide. So why use hunger at all? It is comprehensive. It's comprehensive in terms of diff in different materials, but also in different um, movement types. The improved classification captures some of the, the that variation in geological materials, and of course we can look at movement type by materials. There are some materials that are just more likely to develop some landslides than others, and we capture slope behavior rather than simple categories of stable or unstable. We can look at evolutionary patterns. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, it clarifies a number of slide types that, as I indicated, have fallen into the complex category. Now, there are always going to be landslides that are within that, that range of, of more than one kind of movement or a number of interacting movements. And there is guidance in the original Cruden and Varnes work about how you manage that. So it's a, uh, we've got improvements there. And also it's based on a, a, a wide, a worldwide set of observations. And in fact, the, the, the paper itself um, deals with 
truly global sets of examples that describe different types of, of slope instability. Now, of course, as geologists, we might despair in terms of how crude environments broke, broke up ge uh, earth materials. Everything was rock. Well, unless it was debris or, or earth. But, you know, it's the we, we didn't have very much in the way of subclassification about geological materials beyond beyond rock and, and rock slope problems. Here in Cruden in all, uh, Hunger's work, we do see some additional classification, at least looking at strong versus weak rocks. We can break it down into other materials as uh, within the, the um, description. But you can see within that, we've got rock, clay, mud, in terms of uh, saturated or, or near saturated materials, different coarse materials, debris, and also bringing in peat. Now, there, there's been a lot of work done on peat slides by Jeff Warburton and, and colleagues up in Durham University, but actually the peat slides and the peat slope failures, while challenging, and we present um, an additional set of classification work within the guide to, to manage that, um, it was something that really wasn't dealt with in any sensible way by other classification schemes. And given that actually within the UK framework, we, or UK environment, we have a significant number of peat slope failures, that was certainly worthy of, of inclusion. Now, not all materials get captured terribly well. Um, block and matrix materials, for example, such as these weathered rocks near Stirling Castle in Scotland, uh, don't get captured terribly well by any material classification. And colleagues who have uh, worked in Hong Kong will be familiar with the, the challenge of dealing with deeply weathered materials. And I wouldn't, uh, I, I wouldn't embarrass my, myself with lack of knowledge going any further into that. But suffice to say, where we have complicated materials like deeply weathered rocks, we need to think very carefully about how, how that is handled. So the classification scheme itself allows us to, to look at um, movement types, falls, topples, slides. Um, we can also look at uh, flows, spreads, and then we've got a, a type of movement, slope deformation, which we don't see very much of in the UK. I wouldn't say it's entirely absent, but but that kind of mountain slope deformation, for example, is more is more associated with high mountains. And I'm not aware of many examples. I'm not aware of any examples of it in the UK. But that could be a lack of knowledge, and I I look forward to being corrected if anyone is able to do so. We have a slightly we have an improved form of of classification in terms of movement. We we can look at splitting topples into. Uh, flexural topples and block topples, so more in terms of, of the, the work of Hook and Bray and Wiley and Ma, for example. So that pulls in some of that classification that didn't appear in the earlier classifications. So you can see that actually pulling together movement types and improved geological description gives us uh, a considerably improved classification, although at the cost of some, some additional complexity. One thing that's also worth looking at, however, is also the, the velocity classification. Now, in this, this context, they pretty much follow the work of, of Barnes and Highland and Bur Burkowski in the uh, 1990s, looking, looking at some of the work um, that has looked, looked at how we manage landslides given different rates. And we provide some of that information in the guide. So extremely rapid landslides, there's not very much we can do about it. Uh, it's a ca case of evacuation as, as, as best as possible. But for example, if we're dealing with very slow moving slopes, uh, we, can, we can look at maintenance depending on, on what the, the element at risk is. Um, and that, that element at risk concept is one that we'll come back to later. The other thing that is worth pulling in in the guide that doesn't necessarily appear in Cruden and Farns is activity states. And this, this borrows heavily on the, the working party on landslides of the, the IAEG. Um, 
it, look, look, in the guide, we recommend that land sites are divided into a number of categories. Land sites that are active are those which are currently moving. Straightforward enough. Albeit it might be moving sufficiently slowly to require instrumentation to detect. Land sites that are inactive can then have a number of subcategories, such as uh, dormant, so stop movement, or things that are stabilized. We have acted to, to stabilize those systems, or things that are abandoned where the geomorphic process that has driven instability has, has moved, moved on and uh, no longer is affecting the landslide. And then we've got that final category, which is so often um, used and abused, relic landslides, which are those landslides that formed under a different geomorphological regime that exists today. Now, in the UK, that is normally a different climatic regime, but in different environments, it can also relate to to, to um, changing in changing degrees of tectonic activity, such as uplift. Uh, we see, certainly see that in, in other countries. So although this guide is very strongly focused on the UK environment, you know, we, we have got a worldwide set of landslides to deal with. So this is an example of, of the test in a landslide in Northern Italy, by way of that one of those worldwide examples. And this is a photograph taken in 1994, when it had been reactivated in 1992, I think was the last reactivation of Tessina. Um, and you can see that the, the, the boundaries are very clear. There's very, there's the, the moving section of the landslide is unvegetated. The, the boundaries are clear and marked. The, the geomorphological features are, are, are sharp and precise. By 2008, which was the last time I was on Tessina, um, there's still obviously a, a landslide there, but nevertheless, you can see it's becoming much more vegetated. Some of the, the drainage is reintegrating with the, the, the landslide, and therefore we begin to see an evolution back to a situation where we're looking at a landslide which is currently dormant. Okay, the, um, the, the, lands, the, the geomorphological processes haven't changed, so we can expect at some point it will be reactivated, probably by rainfall. That issue of process response um, concept kind of falls through the natural slopes parts of the guides, and in fact feeds through into mitigation and hazard assessment, and where where we go with that. So ultimately, the idea of understanding the geomorphological processes that drive the instability is key to understanding successful mitigation or dealing with successful mitigation and management. If you get the process wrong, you may well be, be mitigating the wrong, the wrong problem. It also gives us some indication of, of how much mitigation we're likely to, or intervention we're likely to have to do over the lifetime of things that we're looking at. Because normally we're dealing with natural slopes for a reason. Um, it's not charitable as we all might feel, it's probably not, not all for the good of our health. So there's a few key messages to take away from looking at landslides on natural slopes and how they can be classified. There's a number of ways in which we can do it. We have opted for the, the hung, hunger classification scheme because of the benefits of the wider um, materials being used and the, the, the better description of movement times. We have to recognize, however, that over engineering time, the properties of the slope will evolve in response to the current conditions, or importantly, a cha changing set of conditions in terms of a changing climate. And that last point is, is, is a, a critical issue. We need to start underpinning our understanding of natural slopes with a really robust conceptual model. Now, I'm probably saying that to an audience which is already thinking, we need a really good geological model for this. Um, so we're, uh, I'm probably preaching, preaching to the choir on that one, if I can use that phrase. But actually, on getting that kind of conceptual model for natural slopes can be a challenge, but it's an, it's an essential part of the process. And we need to start thinking about how we manage relic landslides and observe these through good geomorphological mapping. Again, I suspect that's something we're preaching to the choir about. And you'll see that actually we deal with this in the guide. 
So one thing I just want to touch on before I, I uh, hand over to Aidy is really looking at landslides and climate change. Now, this is an area where, where there's been quite a significant research effort going, going back now for about 20 years and is, is producing some valuable results, although not necessarily the, at the level of detail, which uh, at site-specific level of detail, for example. And we, we, we provide some information in the guide, guide, but not, you know, there's going to be, sadly, there's no instruction of, well, you need to consider groundwater is half a metre higher. It's much more complicated than that. There is an obvious correlation between landslides and rainfall. And the forecast for, for the UK climate over the, the, the um, next, next uh, yeah, sorry, I just had to check the dates we had in the guide there, um, over, over the, the next 40 or 50 years, um, are that we're going to see, some, we are going to see some changes that we need to give some consideration to. This is a diagram that comes from the British Geological Survey, basically just tracking rainfall with landslide occurrence. Now, the BGS maintain a good record of landslide events. They, they perhaps, the, there are some limitations in those data sets, as, as in fact there's limitations in any landslide inventory, but nevertheless, they have got a, a good data set, set, set to base these kind of observations on. And it's perhaps no great surprise that we see increasing landsliding with increasing rainfall. One of the challenges we face is that UK climate change predictions um, are by their very nature somewhat dynamic as, as our understanding of where the climate is going to change is going, or in fact, what our future scenarios, um, scenario models are. We have got, we have to base our predictions on the basis of different emissions models. And frankly, we are not seeing a great deal of, of um, fortune in terms of mitigating those. Um, I know I'm responsible for sustainable travel in, in my institution, and that, that even, even that small part of our climate plan is challenging. But if we look at distributions of rainfall based on UK C CP18, UK CP18, just look at rainfall alone, we can, if we're looking at a low emissions model for summer rainfall, we expect to see less rainfall. Um, and the higher model, we expect to see a 47% decrease in rainfall in the summer. That's, you know, we're looking at big significant differences, but in winter, we're looking at significant increases. Now, those, those numbers may well be alarming in their own right, but the distribution within those is likely to be substantial. We know that for every degree of increased temp atmospheric temperature, the, the, the atmosphere can hold another 9% of moisture. So as, as a rough figure, our atmospheric scientists would tell me off because for being imprecise, but it's that kind of order. Um, or order of, of difference. And therefore, it, for, for we can expect to see those rain, uh, being dropped in rainfall events. So how can we kind of build that into any kind of guidance or advice? Well, we, we factored in some of the, the elements of UK SIP uh, 2018. Uh, we are looking at uh, changes in our precipitation, and we've got examples of how we can manage that. We don't necessarily, however, have you know, detailed, precise answers for you, because that is in many respects going to be a site-specific problem, and I'll explain why in a moment. We are looking at changes in soil moisture content, for example, and of course that's going to change the, the, the way in which water can uh, enter into the soil. If we've got a lot of te te uh, desiccation cracks forming on the ground surface, infiltration capacity can be higher. However, different, cha different changes in vegetation pattern may mean much higher if interception and so actually more effective rainfalls. So we we've got some complexity here. We also have to recognize that material properties themselves will change in the changing climate. 
and that material properties are not static. And this is, a, this is a, a, a diagram again from the guide where we're actually looking at a conceptual model, looking at the difference between preparatory factors and triggering factors in the deterioration of natural slopes. So as a preparatory factor, we've got long-term weathering. We may have sudden rainfall leading to a dip in stability. That may well be triggered by climate change. We can expect to see greater storm intensity. That will drive erosion events. And therefore, we may see instability developed as a result of, of erosion episodes. And then we could we will look at deterioration over time until we actually start seeing significant long-term problems rather of, because of the preparatory factors, not just the triggering factors. So we have a few key messages to bring out of that. Um, the frequency of landslides in, in the UK is expected to increase. If we've got more storm events and, and wetter winters, we are likely to see an increase in landslides. I don't think that's going to be, be rocket science to anyone. And we will need to think about that in terms of the behaviour of the slopes, not just on our asset, near, near our assets or near our works, but actually affecting a much wider area. Because one of the challenges posed by natural slopes is the fact that they may not be within any site that, that you're dealing with or I am dealing with. They may be in, in completely different person's ownership. And that requires uh, some consideration. Again, we deal with that fact in the guide. Uh, we can expect to see, the, the Met Office tells us that we can expect to see more extreme weather events, and that is going to drive uh, changes in the ground, whether it's the development of partially saturated conditions, the formation of tension cracks and changing the infiltration rates. That's something which will change, and it may well be a, a site-specific problem. But again, we provide some guidance. Um, there's all, all of those different things that go into uh, climate change scenarios are going to create complexities. And so I think instead of just thinking of, of single values, we need to think of ranges of values, and that bring, brings us into probabilities, and that brings us into hazard assessment. Ed. Thanks. Uh, so those of you who don't know me, um, I'm Adrian Coe, although everybody calls me AD. Um, and I'm a Chief Geotechnical Engineer at Atkins Realis. Um, so the bits of the guide that I'm going to talk about today are um, the, the assessment part of the guide, and we do focus on hazard assessment, and I'll go through that in a moment, and then I'll go on to the mitigation strategies going forwards. Um, so um, just to start off with, um, I'll leave this up there. I'm, I'm, I'm sure all of those in the in the room can read it. And these are the hazards that we use, sorry, these are the classifications of hazard and risk that we use in the guide. It's from the Joint Technical Committee um, on landslides, um, fell out 2000, 2008. A key thing to point out is that within the definition of hazard, when you look at that, is that the description of a landslide should include the location, the volume, um, classification and velocity, um, and as, as well as the probability of occurrence within a given period of time. So going back to what Bill was talk, talk, talking about there, uh, and understanding that the processes and the actual landslide classification is a key um, component of that. Um, within the guide it, it itself, um, the main focus is on the hazard assessment. So when we were... Um, before we actually started writing, we were trying to get the project off the ground for Syria. And um, we did a lot of consultation within the within the industry. I think Syria held um, two workshops um, on this and we had um, a field trip as well associated with one of those workshops. And one of the bits of feedback that we got from the industry was that many organisations, particularly the bigger ones like uh, Network Rail, uh, Transport Scotland, and um, National Highways, had their own risk assessment pr procedures in place. And their overarching, overarching methodologies um, were able to take into account um, the consequences of a hazard occurring um, and the spatial and temporal probability. 
So, for example, when we were talking um, to some of the local um, councils about how they dealt with landslide risk, what they were talking about is like, well, we have got a good idea of how many cars, for example, travel along the road at a period, during um, certain times of the day or certain times of the year. They know they've got a good idea when the school buses are, are going to go in. And the vehicles that they have on the road, they know that if that gets impacted by a landslide, what effect that, that might have. Um, what they didn't have a good grasp of was the actual hazard it, itself and the probability of that occurring. And there was a there was a keenness from industry that if if possible, if we could come up with a method for quantification of that hazard. Um, a lot of the hazards assessments that were being done within the industry were qualitative. And when they were um, I'm speaking to a lot of the asset owners that we were working with, it was quite hard to compare um, different hazard assessments if they were done by different organizations or even within a large organization you might have one office doing a slightly taking a slightly different approach to another office so there was a, a kind of view to kind of standardize that the other reason that they were keen to do it was just the um quantification of risk and budget because there was a feeling that if they could quantify the risk of a landslide hazard against other risks, for example, um, the likelihood of a car crash or the likelihood of a, um, a, a, a car going over a level crossing the, the, the railways, then they can compare the level of risk with that and other hazards. And that might, for them, unlock funds um, to treat the landslides. Um, it also... Um, on the other side of things, if you know they could get a better handle, if if, if it was a low risk, um, put appropriate mitigation measures in place. Um, the guide does cover um, risk assessment, but not as in much detail as we do hazard assessment. Um, so the guide, um, that's, I'm not too sure how clear that is for everybody in the room, but the guide does provide guidance on the approach for undertaking different types of assessment. Um, Andrew Hart, that's in the room, will be very familiar with this because this is his, his bit of work. Um, um, I won't go into it in, date, in, in detail because there's a lot of information on it, but this workflow that Andrew's produced um, shows the possible approaches when assessing hazard uh, for landslides and the steps involved. And it includes, um, you know, whether you're assessing a local landslide or a regional landslide, um, and it, it for, for either new assets or, or existing assets as well. Um, the, the guide also goes in, in into detail of what inputs need to be um, included within there and provides a lot of supporting material to go with that. When you look at the list, I'm sure everybody in the room will be very familiar with those. So we've got the death study, death study, sorry, the development of the conceptual ground model, um, field geomorphic mapping and ground investigation, um, analysis, interpretation of data and development of um, the engineering geological model. Um, so within the guide for the death study, what we've got is, you know, we've got guidance on looking at things like aerial photography and remote sensing. And we've got tables to show what you may be able to pick up from um, those, those data sets and, in, and, and incorporate that within an initial assessment of, of, of the site so that you can develop that conceptual ground model to, to start off with. The guide also um, promotes geomorphological mapping, and we've got some um, figures within there that show the landslide types to help with the classification on that. Um, and there's also uh, other data sets in there as well to help, like symbols to use, etc. The guide does promote the use of potentially two fields, uh, two phases of geomorphological field mapping. And the first initial phase may be at your destiny, just to get an, an overall impression of site that, that may also help out with the ground investigation. And then maybe more detailed phase, once you've got better, better data sets um, 
to go in and, and focus on areas that you believe are more critical. Um, in terms of, uh, and we also provide guidance on analysis and interpretation of, of data and development of, of the models going forwards. Um, one of the key things that the guide, guide includes is that um, I think right at the start, um, Bill showed you a picture of the Department of Environment's landslide guide, which is now out, out of print. Within that was um, a number of tables of geological um, strata and their um, the likelihood of, of landslides occurring with um, associated strata. Because that publication is out of print, what we've done is, is we've reprinted that and published that within the guide, and that will form hopefully a good source uh, for the future and an input into the death study going forwards. Um, in terms of information required for hazard assessment, um, the, the, the list is up there. Within the hazard assessment approach that we use within the guide is based on uh, the Australian Geomechanics Society 2007 uh, pub, pub, pub publication. And it is, you know, looking at the, the likelihood of detachment and the likelihood of travel distance um, to be able to get to your target. So not surprisingly, when we're looking at things that need to be in, in, in included within that hazard assessment it is that assessment of detachment and a run out um, with, with, within the data. Now, depending on whether you're going to do a qualitative assessment or a quantitative assessment, it depends on how much de detail you need in, 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 in some of these elements going forward. Obviously, if you're going down a quantitative approach, that requires a lot more detailed in, in, information Um, the advantage, the advantage of putting the time in to get that information is that this is what many many of the asset owners are asking for is the ability to compare landslide risks with other with other hazards that the network faces. Um, it must be pointed out that it's um, only generally in terms of order of magnitude, and you would normally just get a range of of probabilities with, within that. But I think that is still that is still useful to take that that forward. Qualitative risk assessments still have their place, though. Many of the um, much of the data that you need to do to do a thorough qualitative assessment is the same. You just don't have to collect it uh, in in as much detail as you do um, for a quantitative assessment. The really good for that initial assessments being done for high level particularly if you've got a large number of sites that you're looking at and you're trying to compare the risks. Um, but um, ob obviously there is the, the issue that, that has been flagged up is that um, everybody tends to have slightly different opinions on that level of risk. So um, it can, you know, the overall assessment at the end of it can vary as a result of that. Um, Another thing that needs to be taken in, into account is the change over time. So um, Bill's covered this previously, and I've put it up again, is those processes that drive the landslide and how the, those might change, particularly with the effects of, the, of, of climate change. The biggest ones that we're likely to see in terms of landfall, obviously, is rainfall and coastal erosion um, and, and, and how that's going to affect it coming forwards. Um, so when what the guide promotes is that when you undertake these assessments, you also look at the data available to say right, what might happen under certain climate events in the future. How is this going to change over time? So in terms of the hazard assessment, um, here are some key messages that we've got with, within the guide. Um, firstly, the guide does promote uh, qualitative assessments um, to, to compare to enable that risk to be compared with other hazards, um, qualitative assessments are still covered in the guide because they, they are a useful approach uh, when available. Um, and these are the these are the things that you need to um, include within the, the hazard assessments. So it's the identification of landslide types, um, so you know exactly what you're looking for and the impact that that might have 
I'll come on to that in a moment, um, alongside volumes, so you know the extent of that um, and where they're likely to occur, the probability of attack detachment um, or actual failure occurring, um, and looking at the run out to see whether it's going to reach the element at risk. The rate of that movement, which links back to what um, Bill was going on with, with the classification. And once you've undertaken that, you can then do the assessment of the uh, or the calculation of, of the hazard, depending on whether you're using a qualitative or quantitative approach. Um, and obviously, the final point um, is bear in mind that this will change over time, time as, a, as a result of, of natural processes like climate change. Now, within the guide as well, um, we've taken the approach of going down uh, risk mitigation. If you compare the guide with the um, infrastructure embankments and infrastructure cuttings guide that were undertaken previously, um, their focus was on remediation. Um, when we were doing um, the initial workshops for this guide, one of the big feedbacks from industry was actually with natural slopes, um, remediation may be problematic. Um, and a lot of the time, if the, especially if the landslide is in somebody else's land, you don't have access to it. Um, all you may be able to do is some management actions to manage the risk going forward. Um, and there was a, a, a strong steer from the project steering group to push us towards mitigation approaches, not just hard end engineering solutions. One of the other one of the things that the guide goes in into detail is um, that we thought would be really helpful is that initial first emergency response for a, a landslide. Um, it's not uncommon for um, engineering geologists to get called out um, to deal with a landslide within the first instant uh, and, and have to make an assessment of what to do and, 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 and how to take things forward. So what we've tried to do within the guide is provide some um, help a lot, um, along those roads. So what we've come up with is we, we, we've come up with this flow diagram and there's um, some text to, to, to support that. And it's for that initial assessment um, for mainly transportation in, in infrastructure. It doesn't cover um, kind of like the emergency services side of um, a response to a hazard. Um, obviously, the first thing is, is data collection. And within that, it's understanding the, the landslide classification again, which is why um, the landslide classification is such an important thing, as well as the hunger retail, because that classifies the landslide types better. And that, again, includes the location, volume, velocity, and activity state. Um, elements at risk, um, that, you know, need the details of that need, needs to be gathered, as well as... Um, the processes that have, that have initiated the landslide um, going forward. And that, you know, uh, Cook comes into the, 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 the triggers. So, you know, it's the look of what what are the propriety causal factors that initiated the landslide? What are, what are those processes that are driving it? What are the processes that could cause deterioration um, of the landslide over, over, over time? Once you've got that data, you're probably in a good position to do an, a preliminary hazard and, and risk assessment to, to, to classify the risk. It's then, once you've done that, it's about communicating it and, and putting um, in place that initial in implementation of mitigation. In most cases for infrastructure, that's probably going to be closure of that asset, whether that be a road or railway line, until we've got um, thing, things in place um, to, to deal with that, which might be, you know, re removal of, of, of debris. It might be, um, you know, waiting and, and, until the weather's got a little bit better and, and the landslide stopped moving. Um, and then as part of that um, initial response, what we've um, so this once you've got your initial mitigation in place, that buys you a bit of time to do a further monitoring and additional data collection. So, you know, for your landslide 
um, classification you've got, you'll, you'll have an estimation of how much that one slide might be moving. With your monitoring that you've you put in place, you can verify you can verify that. Um, and these things take time, and it's probably best to get that initial mitigation in place. Once you've got that, you can reevaluate that data, and if necessary, um, if it's not matching your conceptual model, ground model of what the landslide's doing, um, you can then go back and you can re revise that and, and and go through the system again, put further mitigation in place. Um, and then out, outside that initial emergency response, you then are going into potentially detailed risk assessment, modeling, and then implementation of a permanent mitigation. Going. So um, as well as that initial um, emergency response, once you go into uh, your long-term strategy, what we've put together is um, some thoughts around around that strategy going forwards, whether that is centered around management measures, um, things like monitoring, warning systems, um, road closures, barriers, um, or drainage imp improvements, or, or engineering works. So if, if I go back um, to this slide here, so this is a picture of a landslide in Eam. It's on the old road that was between Eam and Grindleford. Um, for that mitigation, um, because the costs of the remediation and engineering works for the landslide were quite high, um, the council have decided to permanently close that road. And that is an appropriate mitigation going forwards. Um, you may not have, you know, have the budget to deal with landslides and put those hard engineering solutions again in, which is why the guide covers things um, like appropriate mitigation solutions. Um, in terms of engineering works, um, we split those into three categories. So remedial works are those that where you're looking to solve the problem and provide, provide um, a remedy to a divide standard. Um, Repairs, we talk about in terms of um, correcting a defect. So it might be that if you've got um, a landslide effect in a road, um, your repair might be just to add a, an, another layer of tarmac. If any of you have visited Mantor, um, there's a stratigraphic sequence of tarmac where over time they've just patched the road and you can see that in place. But you know, if you've got limited budget, that might be um, a suitable approach, particularly if you've managed to classify the landslide correctly, and you know that the rate of movement of that landslide is relatively low, that's an appropriate um, engineering solution to take it forwards. And then an improvement is um, where you're looking to improve the stability in a way that is clearly defined and understood. So that might be a betterment approach. So we, you know, in, instead of trying to achieve um, a design that meets, um, say, EC7 design approach one, combination one, or, or combination two. You're looking at just trying to improve the overall condition of that um, slope by, I don't know, say 10% or uh, a nominal percentage. So within that, we've um, provided a framework um, for, for the design for, for the design of, of slope and engineering. And not unsurprisingly, um, the top of the list is to understand the cause of the failure. Um, so once you've got that, you know how to deal with it. Um, it's then talking about agreeing the aims of the project again, with particularly for that natural slopes, you may not be able, or you may not be in a position where you can treat all of the landslide hazards. Um, once that, and then it it's about, selecting appropriate op options, agreeing the, um, the scope of the design, undertaking the design, and then de design verification. So um, the case that I'm going to use just to run through those is the Crag End landslide, um, which we've uh, worked on at Atkins Realis um, over the years. So those that are familiar with Northumberland, it's by the Cragside National Trust property. And you've got the B6344 uh, that runs next to it. 
Now, as you can see by the conceptual ground model that we've got here, there's a number of landslide um, processes that are going on there. It's not just one landslide. But what's been affected um, is the roads. You can actually see within the model here that you've got um, some shallower landslides that are occurring within there that's causing uh, the distortion uh, to, to the pavement. Beneath that, you've got the much deeper um, failure mechanism that's going on. You've got the river coquette uh, that, that, that's running through that's um, causing erosion at the toe of the landslide that's ongoing. It's potentially a driving factor. You've also got artesian water, water pressure that, that, that's coming up from depth. And on this site, um, you're, it's included within, within one of the, the uh, case studies at the back of the drawing. Um, just put in the, the, um, the ground investigation to um, get an understanding of what that water pressure was, 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 was quite hard. I won't go into it in detail here, um, but it's worth going and having a look at that within the guide. Um, so the processes, again, going back to those and how those are acting on the landslide and how those might change over time also um, is an important part to understanding that and, and, and developing the engineer and geological model. Um, because you've got so much going on, it's not. It may not be possible to fix all of all you know all elements of that landslide going forward. So you know there was a lot of discussion with the local council on you know the approaches to take forward for, from there, and that fed into your option selection. So as you can see within this diagram, we've got um, for a you, we, we've got some pre deep pressure relief wells uh, to take away the art artesian pressure at, at, at depth and, and the slow down. But, the, the the landslide. Um, we've got some slope drainage installed um, for option B. Um, we've got a sawmill solution going going in here, and then we've got quite a heavy engineering solution for D going here, which is a, a, a contiguous piled wall going in. Um, obviously, you've got to understand what causes you know that you you or what failure mechanisms that you're going to address. Um, within the long slide and you've got to you know this considerate there's other considerations that need to come into account within the option stage um like um compatibility with the environment um access and buildability and um the affordability of what you're doing you know what are your uh, initial capital costs compared with your operational costs and how long are these solutions um going going to last and as i said in terms of design um you've also got to then consider what design approach do we use um for this can we get away with the design approach one combination combination two or do we need to go down one of the other approaches that that, that you know code seven talks about um you know do we look at a betterment approach do you, do you look at an observational approach going forward um and 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 and, and take that 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 through and obviously, over time, those design assumptions need, need to be validated, um, particularly for natural slopes, because they are they are complex. And there's a lot of, um, we've talked about the processes as being important and how those might change over time. And it's just keeping an eye on those potential changes going forwards. So the key messages um, that we've got um, for mitigation is firstly understand the landslide type that you're dealing with and how that might change as a result of natural processes. Um, keep harping on about that, but it is important. Um, and those mitigation options that you're proposing um, need to be based around the engineering geological model that, that you've got developed. Um, And, you know, particularly important, um, which we've seen on a number of projects, it's discussing and agree, agreeing the, the mitigation of, of approach and getting buy-in um, from all parties that are in, in, involved um, and understand the limitations and constraints because on a natural slope, you may not be able to fix everything. Um, and it, it may be a short-term solution, may be um, a better approach. 
and understanding the serviceability limits and the consideration of the betterment approach might be more applicable in, in many instances. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, I think we're pretty much bang on time. Um, so I think, yeah, if we can open the floor to questions both uh, within the room and I think, Scott, you've got um, essentially some from online as well. At the moment, we've got, we haven't got anything online at the moment. So now is your chance. If you're sitting at home, John's got his hand up already. Thank you, Scott. Um, if you do ask a question, can I uh, ask you to give your name and your affiliation? Uh, but first, before I ask my question, and that was brilliant, thank you very much. Uh, I'm, two notices, in addition to Scott's earlier on. One is in October related to this. One is uh, in October, the QRA engineering group, who Dave Giles, who is here and I are involved in, have got a field trip on the Holderness Coast. I think it's somewhere like the 25th of October. Uh, um, till, sea cliffs, famous failures. So um, please go and have a look at the QRA engineering group LinkedIn page. And um, I don't think we can sign up yet, but it'll be coming soon. And the second notice, uh, tell me if I'm getting this wrong, the engineering group field trip next year is going to be a Dennis Brunsden Memorial field trip, and it's going to be it's like to be based in in Portland and around Dorset. So that's all about Dennis and landslides. Again, details are being worked out, so just keep an eye open for that. I think that will be also be fantastic. Question at last. Um, I do an awful lot of um, insurance based domestic landslide work for insurers and for loss adjusters. Somebody's garden falls down. Uh, all, that, all that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm interested to hear, first of all, is when you say you consulted with injury, uh, injury, in, industry, 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 sorry, yeah. um, who are you talking about? So I'm just trying to think who was on the project. Well, were, were the insurers involved? Were the ABI involved? Anybody like that? No, we didn't. We didn't discuss it. Insurers. I don't believe that they were on the project steering group, but we did have a number of consultants on the project steering group that had done work for insurers and also contractors that had done work for insurers. We also had, just to broaden the list out, we had academic institutions and, and we had um, the likes of um, Transport Scotland, Welsh Government, um, National Highways, etc. And just one other observation, your sort of emergency response little circle yeah, which I, I, I realised I've done that sort of thing loads of times, but never really thought about writing it down. What one aspect that I find is difficult when you're dealing with houses is that um, if the house looks like it's been damaged or is threatened, the local council come along and slap a dangerous structure notice on it immediately. Harris fencing goes up, and you can't get in to have a look at it, so you're immediately constrained. Oh, you can't go; that's too dangerous. That's just one for the audience. We've got a couple of. Um online questions so we've got some thanks from online as well but uh we'll start at the top so how does the guide define a natural slope i would have to check what the definition is it does define a natural slope without having the guide in front of me i couldn't give yeah I, I, i'm i'm the verbatim. i would need to go and check and check on the guide but if, it, if i My recollection is that it's a, a slope form of natural materials which has not, not undergone significant modification. Yeah. So it, it does exclude obviously cuttings where it's been, you know, not man made. So obviously there is um, a Syria guide for cuttings, and also there's a Syria guide for embankments as, uh, 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 as well. Okay. Second question comes from Stephen Ford. Yeah. <laughs> um, are there any thoughts regarding opportunities for prevention rather than post-failure mitigation, i.e. getting early, for example, drainage improvements, erosion protection, sorry, protection, etc.? Yes. So, um, uh, groundwater and surface water drainage is, and um, management and mitigation is, is included within the guide, and also um, considerations for vegetation establishment as well, because all of those have a beneficial effect. Super. Thank you. Chris Evans says, originally enjoyed some months ago in, uh, sorry, originally enjoyed some months ago in Leeds. Thank you for a very good presentation. Thanks, Chris. 
Steve Parry asks, suggest you clarify that the engineering geological model referred to, is that contained in IAEG C25? So we throw that back to Steve Parry since he was a co-author. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that is that is where um that is where the, the, the definition comes from. And obviously with uh, Steve being a co-author, um we have got the correct definition. Always good to be pointed out when you've made a mistake with yeah. somebody online. Um, anyway, right, Rory Murphy, last one online at the moment. Thanks for the presentation. In your experience, are there any features that engineers, geologists commonly overlook when assessing landslide hazards? I like that one. Yeah. Oh, we, we might have an answer from in the room. Oh, God. Oh, hang, on, hang on, hang on. So we've got co-author in the room uh, of Andrew Hart. I'm, I'm sorry, but could you just introduce yourself before you answer there? Andrew Hart, Technical Director of Atkins Realis, the geomorphology. Short and sweet. I think we've got another... another one in the room. Yeah. Uh, that's with the WSP. Uh, yeah, great, great presentation from both of you. I, I just wanted to ask if there is any definition for uh, acceptance criteria in terms of the probability of failure, or is down to the risk appetite of the asset owner? Sorry, the probability of failure or the, or the probability of the, hazard occurring. Yeah, the likelihood that something, uh, if we have any acceptance criteria in terms of... Uh, we don't cover it in terms of um, acceptance of hazard. We just calculate the probability or the likelihood of that hazard occurring based on probability of detachment and the kind of like probability of whatever the, that detachment, whether it's a landslide, whether it's all a rock ball reaching the element of risk. Okay. As part of the risk assessment, um, although we cover it in um, not as much detail, um, within that, you're, you do cover elements of kind of like the spatial probability, um, you know, whether somebody's, um, whether there is an element in there or how much within um, the area of impact. That element is the, the temporal probability. How long is somebody spent in that area? Or the, the element of risk within that area, and within that, what we've published is um, from memory. It's the guidance that's included within the AGS, where it covers levels of acceptable risk or tolerable risk, I should say, um, for different organisations, um, both in the UK and, for example, the HSC, but also. Um, other overseas organisations as well. Actually, when we were writing a previous guide, it became apparent that there was quite a variation in risk tolerance in, from different sectors. Um, hi, um, Amir Abassi from CGL. Thanks, that was really interesting. Um, I did have a question from like a small scale. So if you think of like a conventional geotechnical design, yeah. say for example, you're looking at a highway structure and it's within a context of a wider slope, like a natural slope, you're potentially looking at a design life, you're looking at engineering something for a design life, but you also want to consider global stability of a slope system. What I'm always wondering is how then do you consider that with climate change impacts? Because you're looking at the global stability of a wider slope and you're designing the structure for a certain design life, but the global slope might significantly change within that design life period. For example, you're suggesting something, you know, for a short term, but, you know, the, the lifespan of the slope might not last the design life of the structure. And I'm just wondering how, how can you actually assess climate impacts or the future of, of kind of geotechnical structures? Um, I'll have a go at answering this and do you want to check it? So um, let's just take you back to understand your classification first of what last type of last life has it. Oh, sorry. I'll go back to the speaker. I'll like move, move. If you want to wander around, we can give you, you can, if you want to, you can be my no, no, if you fine. want. I'll, I'll, I'll stay here and wave my arms about as a number. So if you know what your type of landslide you're dealing with, that will give you an indication of what, then what climatic um, 
effects might have or climate change effects will have. So if we look at, say, um, your debris type um, landslides, so debris, debris flows and, and, and debris avalanches, they may, they're likely to be more impacted by what um, the short intense periods of rainfall that, that, that are coming on. If you're looking at, say, um, your more, um, an, an asset where you've got like um, potentially a deeper sea to say circular type landslide, something like that, what you may get an effect in is um, a change in um, groundwater level and pour water pressure over, over, over the winter months. So, for example, um, I don't know many areas of the UK at the moment where the ground isn't extremely saturated still, um, and that has that will have, that has an effect. You've also got to take into account, well, um, are you on, you know, with your vegetation, how is that going to behave in terms of climatic change? Are you rely Is your slope relying on um, vegetation to knit that upper surface together and, and, and hold it. If we have periods of um, low rainfall and drought, is that going to kill off your vegetation? Are the materials that you're dealing with, are they likely to give the, if, that, if they dry out significantly, are they likely to give uh, tension cracks, um, which can be quite extensive? Um, you, so what if you had a metastable, not a landslide, it's not a landslide, it's a metastable slope yeah. that's a relic or, or a dormant. So, for example, if you're just considering global stability, but you have a dormant slope, it could theoretically in the future, 120 year, 70 year condition with significant rainfall reactivate. Yeah. Is that something that for kind of conventional global stability analysis, you would still consider it, it was in a wider, if you didn't have an, if you didn't have a landslide and it was just a regular sloped i think the, term, the terminology you're using there when you start talking about things being relic or dormant mm. you're almost you're starting off from the assumption that a landslide is there mm. because you're talking about a reactivation because if you, straight away you you're kind of accepting that you've got a slope which has had some kind of movement on it in the past um what i'm not very clear about is is we you're talking. I, th I think you're asking the question about where, how that slope potentially interacts with a separate asset. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And at, at the different time scales that that's going to happen over. It's just one thing because you you always see global stability analysis and it's assessing a slope in a local scale, but when it is tied in with a larger natural slope, there's no there's never really a consideration of climate change. So you're kind of kind of considering the lifespan of a structure. But then the actual lifespan of the slope that is surrounded by isn't being considered separately. I think what we're what we're saying within the guide is that need that you should be considering that as part of your assessment. So before you get to your design and your analysis, you need to be considering right. Well, actually, what are the processes that are going to act on the slope? How is that going, going to change? Thanks. So I don't. I that was a good question. Thanks. I haven't told every, told everybody to to give their name and affiliation. I didn't do that before, did I? John Davis from GCG. Uh, so I'm I'm just going to come back to Amir and may, maybe something like the A83 is a good example here in the sense that, that there were clearly predefined older debris flows which were reactivated, but there are other slopes dotted about mountain slopes in Scotland, and the Lockheed one you showed at the beginning, Bill, is a good example, which were first-time failures. Now, if you're at the A83 and you're designing all those catch structures, then clearly you have to think about um, future failures, new ones. And they, they, obviously you can't stop them and you can't keep the road open. Maybe this avalanche shelter will do that. But at the moment, you have to consider it. But you, it, it's an imponderable problem. And if I remember rightly, that there is... There was some discussion on this exact thing in a network rail sense, sense in the um, that report that Robert Mayer put together on the back of the Carmont um, derailment that killed those three poor guys um, near Stonehaven. So this is it's kind of a very difficult problem for somebody like Network Rail and to an extent Transport Scotland because these debris flows are everywhere. But it's actually, exist so, absolutely, so, absolutely so, everywhere. Yeah. So on that scenario, if you were the designer that did that and you hadn't considered 
the wider slope and then a, a failure occurred, would you be a liable party because you hadn't considered? Well, I think in those, in those particular situations, the slope that fails isn't yours. So there's very little you can do about it. If it was in a wider, yeah, <laughs> okay, thanks. I mean, I, I mean, just a point of interest, one of the um, organisations we consulted with was Highland Council in, in the early days. And they were saying, um, you know, if you look at their, if, if just look at their area that they cover um, within the hazard mapping that, that that's undertaken, it's just like, well, we can't even look in, de look in detail at all of these potential hazards that we've got. And, like, no, okay. and actually for, uh, you know, for, you know, for them um, with the budgets they've got you know they know that they've got some high priority areas they'll, they'll focus on those like string ferry bypass but, but but other areas you know it might be a more um reactive approach is the only thing that they can do okay we've got another one from online um i assume this is chris wolf good evening chris um, do you think that the guide helps raise the expectations on the owners of natural slopes to proactively manage them more? It should help provide a, fr a good frame of reference for conversations between adjacent asset owners, in upon the point here, of the slope to think about foreseeable risks. Yes, it should. That's my feeling. Yeah. I, I think it should. When when an individual asset, uh, if individual asset owners should probably be thinking about having discussions about steep slopes beyond their their immediate uh, ownership. That's my personal feeling. Um, I don't know whether what the legal situation is. I'm not terribly sure what the practice pra current practice is. But if we're looking at a situation where we're moving to a much much wetter climate in winter, you're probably going to have to start thinking about what is up slope of you. I, I could be wrong here, and I'm sure if I am, I'll be corrected immediately online. But I think Network Rail have recently completed a fairly large study to look at adjacent slopes yeah, so for their network. They've done, yeah, they, they, they've, they've done a lot of work on their on on, on their network, um, and you know, there's other organisations that have done the same. I think um, Transport Scotland have. Um, so you've got the work. Um, the landslide study that was done back in so 2008, eight. Eight. yeah, I think 2008, um, that Mike Winter was, was heavily involved in. Um, and then you've got um, forestry, forestry and Scotland have also done um, a similar um, assessment of their data sets as well. That's a, quite a high level to say these areas are, uh, you know, I've got a high, you know, Hazard level. These these have got a lower area. What it, I don't I don't think what they've done is focusing on the. They've been able to focus in on each specific site in that level of detail. Any more in the yes, yes. Hello, uh, Luke Johnson, Atkins Rellis. Um, I'm familiar with the AGS guidelines that you used for the probability travel intersection. I've done some work with it in Australia with the Transport for New South Wales uh, slope risk assessment guidelines. One thing we found when we're translating that back to New Zealand was there was a couple of holes, first seismicity and second New Zealand's higher acceptance of risk. Um, did you find similar to us when we're translating it from Australia across to New Zealand, was there any holes or anything you found you had to add or any observations in that vein from a more global perspective? Okay. Do you want to comment yeah. first yeah. and then I'll, I'll comment. Okay, so, so, so um, <laughs> there is, I mean, as Bill mentioned earlier, you know, within all of the people that we consulted, there were different levels of tolerable or acceptable risk. Which is why the guide has focused primarily on definition of hazard, and that's why we've, we've, we've kind of stopped there. Because um, once you've got that framework together, then you can take it on. And, and... yeah, the, I mean, obviously there are some some parts of the New Zealand framework that we don't need to worry about. We don't really need to worry about seismicity in the UK, although we we occasionally get earthquakes and. I, I think the last firm 
evidence of an earthquake triggered landslide in UK, probably about 6,700 years ago. Oh, that, that, well, that, this, sounds better. <laughs> this sounds better. There was some suggestion that there was one triggered in North Wales, that, but the BGS asked, uh, raised a concern about but um, I will, this is going to be more interesting. So I may have to eat my words on that. Um, John. But other, otherwise, I don't think we had monumental problems in that translation because the Australian framework wasn't wildly different from some of the things we were thinking of. Um, that, that framework is now up for re reassessment, actually. So the, it was interesting. They had some, we had some discussion about what, what's going on. So we'll see how that evolves. Thank you. I'll take one more in the room if there is one. No. Right. In that case, all that is left to do is say thank you very much. That was fascinating. I think that's a, a, it's a record for a while in the room, and it's certainly a record online. So I'm hoping everybody found that as enjoyable as I did. Um, I will certainly be talking to you in a minute about asset owners and risks, because I think that's a separate conversation that, that stretches beyond landslides that we can we can pick up. Um, could I just ask then that in the room if we I'd look hang on before I do that. Thank you to everybody online. Nearly, nearly always. Never forget your audience. Never forget your audience, people. Thank you to everybody online. Thank you for taking time. Thank you for those people that are still online as well, watching the QA. Uh, but in the room, if we could thank our speakers in the usual way. Thank you very much. Thank you. Not all of my